Ladies and gentlemen, I have Yolanda Genova. She's a news reporter in New York. Her coverage at Business Insider Centers on politics, women's issues, and equality. She has a long, long resume. Make sure you check her out and check out her social media. But she has some insight here that is going to be quite, quite revealing. Uh, thank you for being on the show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about this accident. Um, I did a little research and I found that it does happen on occasion according to reports um, that individuals grab their gun when they think they have grabbed their taser. Um, but the taser is quite different than a gun, especially when you're talking about a person who is trained and recertified every single year to utilize a taser and they should distinctly know the difference between a taser and a gun. Um, what say you to the explosive situation uh, that just went down uh, where Dante Wright uh, has now been killed? Well, research does show accidental or unintentional weapon discharges have happened a lot in the past. Over a seven year period spanning from 2012 to 2019, there have been at least 1400 cases of unintentional weapon discharges by police across hundreds of law enforcement agencies. So it's quite common and in those 1400 plus cases, at least 21 people have died from it and become casualties. Now, are we just taking this at face value? Because when you say that, I'm thinking, okay, I think some of these cops are lying. I'm not saying all of them are lying, but that seems quite staggering to have that many individuals who are trained to utilize weaponry accidentally shoot someone and accidentally kill people in the process. So here's my question on the other side. If you can mistake a gun for a taser, how many of these cops mistook their taser for the gun, right? How many cops said I was reaching for my gun, but I actually grabbed my taser. And so the person is still alive today because I tased them rather than shot them. Do we have any data on that? There hasn't been any data on that as far as I know at least, but the striking part about these numbers is that they likely don't reflect the reality or the gravity of the situation. And that's because law enforcement agencies have very different reporting requirements across the board. And that makes it very difficult to quantify exactly how many times officers have unintentionally discharged their weapons and how many times this has happened in the past. But we do know that this has happened in the past a lot because of these numbers. Why is it that we, we don't have a federal mandate to report something as serious as shooting someone and a cop saying oops. Why is there no mandate to report this? Well, it really depends. It's a state by state legislation thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times there is no negligent homicide law, for instance. In Iowa in 2009, there was no such thing. and. I mean, that, that carries over in a lot of cases. And one of the most prominent cases is what happened with Eric Harris in Oklahoma. Eric Harris was a black man and there was this officer um, who shot him after screaming taser and he shot him with a gun instead of a taser. So it's very, very prominent. That happened in 2015. You know, I looked up the um, negligent homicide statute and some states have it. Uh, and many other states that do have this statute, it's not even a felony if someone is convicted of um, negligent homicide because to meet the statutory requirements, it means that you had no malice intent whatsoever. So yeah, you basically get a slap on the wrist even if you are able to be successfully prosecuted. And I'm thinking about Maryland. Maryland just passed this massive law where you can be punished up to 10 years in prison for excessive force. Earlier this morning, I had a conversation with a guy named Dr. Cedric Alexander. Dr. Alexander is a former police chief former deputy mayor, and he's the former president of Noble, the national organization of black law enforcement executives. And the way he broke this down is he said no one else, none of the other cops thought this was a situation where a taser was even needed because she was the only person that pulled out anything, right? And he says this is a simple case of a police officer being more aggressive than is necessary. Do you think some of these accidental discharges or cops saying, hey, I didn't mean to pull the trigger. Is this also connected to the aggression associated with their attitude toward the person they're trying to apprehend or possibly trying to kill? 
It could be, yes. Um, there could be individualized and institutionalized racism at play here, um, especially in cases that involve black people like Eric Harris and Dante Wright. And it's also very interesting in this case that the police chief himself said that the officers do receive regular training, particularly in the area of taser and firearm deployment. But even with police trainings, accidental discharges still happen. It just seems so extreme. You have an individual who's been on the police force 26 years. She's president of the local police union. A taser is yellow, the handgun is black, a taser is plastic. The handgun is made of steel. The taser is light, the handgun is heavier. I mean, the list goes on and on. At some point, you have to even question, and I know this sounds really, really cynical. Is it possible? that this was not accidental at all, but made to look accidental if you know you can get away with it. And I know that sounds so just like there's no way anybody would think that, right? But people are questioning the legitimacy of even the accidental defense. What do you say to that? I think it's really hard to speculate what goes on in a person's mind. But I mean, these accidental discharges can happen because of a variety of factors. There can be muscle spasms involved, an adrenaline rush could cause it, for instance. And it could also be individualized racism that's Mm -hmm. the driving force behind it. Criminal justice researchers and experts that I've spoken to say that accidental discharges still happen because police trainings are inadequate and they really don't address these potential scenarios well. So what needs to happen now? Is it is the solution more training, right? Because okay, we say that, but this person was on the force 26 years and had been recertified year after year after year. She's head of the police union locally. I'm sure she has had her fair share of training. Do you think training is the problem here? Certainly, she is a senior level officer. She's had 26 years of experience, as you say, and experts told me that it's not just police trainings that really need to be overhauled and reformed. In cases of people of color being victims of police violence, there is a lot of institutional racism behind it and at play. So yes, training should better teach officers about gun safety and taser safety. But in its entirety, the police institution in the country should at the very least be more closely scrutinized for ways that race plays a very crucial part in police procedures and policies. There was a movement by the previous administration, presidential administration, to get rid of certain aspects of race relation theory or understanding systemic or implicit bias. We know that bias exists, racial bias exists in policing as well. But we also know that there's a fight to stop anyone from having legitimate training or legitimate conversations inside of their police agencies. How do you think we overcome that barrier when so many of these police agencies are truly independent agents? They are localized, there's no federal mandate for them to undergo this training so that they can have a better understanding of their own biases. It's definitely tough and because there is no federal mandate, it's really, really hard to unify all these law enforcement agencies. There are hundreds of law enforcement agencies across the country. Some experts have suggested to me that there are certain measures for gun safety that are taught and emphasized in police trainings. And those are places that people can start. For example, when you're handling a gun, you always have to assume that it's loaded. You keep your finger off the trigger until you're absolutely sure that you need to pull it. Those are some of the measures that are taught and seemingly they're not taught very, very well. So that's a place to start. Yeah, you know, it's sad. It's in our face again. I mean, just down the street, literally, you have a trial going on of a an unarmed black man being killed by another cop. Um, Benjamin Crump said he would have thought that cops, especially in that area, would have been on their best behavior. Uh, that's a direct quote from Benjamin Crump. If it's if it's training, then that's fixable, but. If it's systemic racism, you got some folks, they're gonna be racist no matter what. I don't care what training they go through. How do we get rid of those people from the ranks of law enforcement? Well, it takes a lot of education, right? And that's a whole huge endeavor to undertake. It's very complicated and there are initiatives out there like defund the police or reform the police, various types of initiatives that are trying to position the police and their systemic racism at play against each other. and. The functionality of that is that maybe it will be reformed in some way, maybe it will not be, but it really depends. Yeah, they better start reforming because the way this thing is going, the nation will be severely divided, even more so than it is now. I appreciate your time today, thank you, it was a joy.
Thank you. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.